And, you know, in introducing Rob, I don't really need to introduce Rob, but I will say yesterday, you know, uh, you know, we were talking about the new Rob Califf, and I described him as Rob Califf Unchained. Um, and, and someone said, has Rob ever been chained? Um, and, and, and the picture that came to mind to me was one of those King Kong movies where King Kong is in chains, but he's just snapping them. Um, but Rob doesn't even need to snap the chains anymore. They're off. So here he is. <laughs> Thanks, Greg. I'll, I'll see if I can rise to the challenge you've just, uh, just posed. I, you know, if you had put a, uh, a motion meter on me yesterday, I would have had incredible highs and incredible lows, I have to say. Um, so it was really quite, um, quite an interesting day. So I um, the, got up early this morning and just redid the slides. A lot of it's the same material, rehashed in different ways, but maybe some of it's a bit different based on uh, what I heard. So um, first of all, I do want to, a lot of people commented on the, um, on the musical opening of the session yesterday. And um, I think we do, in the midst of all this, need to keep a little bit of humor in what we do. So part of what I've done to start out is to talk a bit about doctrines and creeds and things like that. But on a serious note, I really do believe the traditional system you know, has done a lot of good. People are living longer, at least until this year, in the United States than they ever have. As, as you all know, the last report we saw a downtick in life expectancy for the first time in many decades. And a very interesting article in yesterday's JAMA about the impact of uh, opioid poisoning on those uh, statistics to think about. But basically, you know, my point is not that the system has failed, but my main point is that I believe we're in a new era where um, we can shed the old system and move on to something that's quite different, and I believe we really should. And the reason is that the old system has really, and this came up over and over yesterday, it's just gotten bloated and burdened with practices that are not only more expensive, but also I think actually making things worse. Because they massively increase the cost without improving quality and sometimes make quality worse because the SOPs have become more important than the science of clinical investigation. And um, I think one of the most damaging parts, which I know is what Greg really wanted me to talk about, is what I regard as the asymptotic effort to record each data item more precisely because of the mistaken notion that a more reliable estimate of treatment effect will be derived for outcomes that matter by getting every data item more precisely accurate, which is patently incorrect. And um, until we get that point across, um, we're going to continue to waste hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, I won't mention any particular drug names anymore after I did it yesterday, because that seems to get people uh, even more worked up. But I do think that by refocusing on uh, quality by design, use of automation, and analytical methods, we really are now poised to dramatically accelerate evidence generation while also improving the quality of the result. And as I was writing this last night, it actually really reminded me of the triple aim where, um, you know, it is evident once you see the inside of healthcare that um, it's highly likely that less expensive healthcare is better in many cases. So you can um, have a more efficient system that actually delivers a better result instead of assuming that by spending less money you're automatically um, sacrificing quality, which I think is another Greg Simon point. The idol of saying, well, because it's safety, it means we have to do stupid stuff that costs a fortune to show people that we're really concerned about safety when that's not actually what we're doing with the practices that we have. So this, this is... Um, if anyone uh, doesn't uh, worship at this doctrine, um, please uh, comment on it uh, either now or later. But this is a set of beliefs I think I heard yesterday. First, I mean, we really are in an explosive phase of science. It's, it's, it is radically different now on the front end. I am not hearing uh, pharma companies complaining about dry pipelines at all. The big problem now is that um, we're putting things on the shelf because we can't afford to do the development. And this is only the beginning because when you look at uh, the impact of 
digital information applied to things like the immune system, um, the, the number of revealed biological targets is exploding uh, exponentially right now. So this is, uh, but this is fueling an increase in costs, and it came up also over and over yesterday. And uh, we can defray this for a while, but ultimately people are want to go, going to want to know whether uh, the things that they're spending their money on actually are bringing value. And so this overall rising cost of health care requires an assessment of value, not just of the new therapies, but relative to the old therapies, because uh, we're, we're going to rapidly get into the era of replacement. And in fact, we are uh, replacing right now across health systems in favor of certain diseases at the expense of others. And I can pick on Greg here because his uh, disease, uh, mental health, is the one that's suffering the most right now. Some things get paid for, others don't. And when uh, some things are really, really expensive, health systems um, adapt by cutting in the places that people uh, don't notice. And then we have the fact that transparency is increasing, which is a good thing. So we can look at the system now in ways we couldn't before, but this just makes people more aware of the evidence gaps and where they really exist. So the sum of all this is a dramatic need to answer more questions about therapeutics. It's not that the need wasn't there before, but it's really, really obvious and it's going to get more and more painful because the current evidence generation system has unsustainable costs. It's not capable of delivering the goods, no matter how much we try to work on it around the edges. And, you know, again, this is not bad, but I do think we have to acknowledge that the old doctrine and the priests that guarded the old doctrine built it at a time when automation wasn't possible because there was very little electronic data. Doctors wrote everything on paper. Um, and then as time of, uh, evolved, we developed parallel si uh, world computing systems where uh, the way it worked was that uh, nurses and others would take the doctor's written notes and write it down and then type it into a computer. And then we um, have been paying a fortune for nurses and others to fly around on airplanes and check that the information matches, leading to truly bizarre things which are just now beginning to get worked out where you have people printing out their electronic health record notes to produce a written record so that a nurse can check and make sure it matches what's in the parallel universe electronic system that's sitting next to it. Um, and, you know, the expense of all this is uh, in the hundreds of millions of dollars for some clinical trials. And the regulators devised a doctrine called GCP to enable these arcane practices to be done in a consistent fashion. But consistency doesn't necessarily mean better especially if you're applying one set of principles to the entire array of different kinds of questions that need to be asked. But what made it even worse was that local experts took the doctrine and amplified it into voluminous SOPs with multiple interpretations. And um, one, of the, one of the times about 20 years ago this really hit me was when a CEO of Pharma came to our business school, I won't mention which company, and demanded a one-on-one -on -one meeting with me. I didn't know what I had done wrong, <clears throat> but he just wanted an hour to ventilate. And what he said was, every time I come up with a great way to reduce the cost of doing research to generate what we need to get things on the market, an entire team of people in my own company take my simple document and turn it into a multi-hundred page set of SOPs that no one can understand that end up increasing the cost of, uh, of what's being done. So the thesis uh, for today's talk that I have is that in a mistaken understanding of the theory and purpose of clinical trials, the regulated clinical trials industries diverted enormous resources to an effort to increase precision. And unfortunately, uh, the academic NIH-driven clinical research industry has adopted some of this thinking through the proliferation of forcing people to take GCP. But now here's where another religious analogy comes in. I don't think the right thing to do is to tear down the temple. <laughs> um, there was a reason that things had to happen the way they did before there was the opportunity for more automation and more tailoring of the research system to the particular needs driven by different questions. 
and in such a vast enterprise with so much at stake, not just, and in here I'm not talking so much about the pocketbooks of companies, I'm talking about the patients who, and um, as I've learned to say, the people now, because many uh, times now it's not patients per se that are in studies, the participants might be uh, free living people who are not in the healthcare system. Uh, there, there does need to be a structure. People do need to have some idea of how to do things uh, correctly that's agreed upon. So, so we've got to sort of shed the mold that we've been in and go to something new, um, but without totally tearing down the idea that people need guidance. Everyone can't be an expert in the field in this vast enterprise. So. Um, I would say we need to change the focus for most of what we do from precision to reliability. And um, this is just a definition right out of the dictionary of the two. I would argue there's a need for precision in some kinds of research that's the dominant need, where you have small samples, um, intense measurements that are expensive, you'd better get them just right. But for much of what we're talking about today, the real need is for reliability, where a focus on precision actually detracts from reliability because it limits, for example, the size of the study that you can do, the number of endpoints that you have. And you'll notice the sort of um, description of the synonyms for reliability, I think, are really important. Dependable, good, well-founded, authentic, valid, genuine, sound, and true. So the, these are the attributes that we need to look for. So now the uh, old material, um, what we're really talking about here, um, I think I would argue for the most part excludes these early translational steps. That is when you go to do a phase one clinical trial, you're putting something uh, of a drug or a device, you're doing something to someone that's not been done before, you'd better um, measure everything with a great deal of precision because you don't wanna miss something and often you're testing a biological concept where uh, the measurements per se are absolutely critical. For example, and I'll come back to this, the exact time of the administration of the drug. Having run an early phase clinical trials unit for a while, um, it is a magnificent thing to see the synchronized clocks that are in those units so that the very moment that a drug is administered, the time is reliably uh, recorded because there are, are critical elements of um, pharmacology that need to be taken into account. But as we get beyond phase 2A um, into some aspects of phase 3 and beyond, um, I, I think we're in this other element where um, reliability becomes a key issue. Are we providing the answers to the questions that matter uh, to the patients who are going to be affected um, by the research system? And by any measure that you make, at least, and here I'm focused on the United States, the system is undesirable. It's not, as I've already said, it's not generating the evidence that's needed. But in addition to that, if you make rounds at our best centers and talk to the doctors, uh, they don't find research so enjoyable. I mean, for me, it was always a lot of fun to do research. But um, most of our young faculty now, and I've made rounds at a lot of places over the last two years, um, our young faculty general, generally see research as a set of rules that they have to adhere to to meet compliance goals and not um, an effort to uncover uh, truth with all the joy that's involved uh, in that effort. And you can overcome that unpleasantness by paying people enough money to do it. I, I uh, am now, now that I'm in the position of being a sponsor for half of my um, job, um, uh, you know, seeing cancer clinical trials where the cost per patient is $100,000 per patient to get a clinical trial done, it just, that, that just cannot be sustainable. It's not the right way to do it. And, you know, this is a very old slide, but um, the Bake Off continues to see if any specialty can rise above 15% of its um, uh, um, key decisions being based on high quality evidence and so far no one's been able to do it. And you know in this crisis of opioids um, I don't think it's terrible that we have guidelines that are not based on the highest quality ev evidence but surely we could have at least one out of 13 recommendations based on high quality evidence. 
I mean, just getting one, that would be a major victory um, in the uh, opioids <coughs> crisis. So, and then, um, you know, the independent assessment of the cost of clinical trials is shown here, and anyone involved in the industry knows about this, and it's having a huge impact on the decisions that are being made in portfolios of potential trials to be done. Uh, we're seeing runaway inflation because I think of this false idol of precision as opposed to reliability. <clears throat> and we're paying a heavy price for it. Their entire, if you look at the uh, um, Lancet last week, there's a global um, burden of disease series and you know, the biggest causes of death and disability are the areas that industry is investing the least in right now. And I'm not opposed to investing in rare diseases. We need to do that. But one of the big reasons I'm given, now that I'm on the other side of the fence again, is simply the cost of the clinical trials, the way they're being done. Um, companies don't see that they'll be able to get return on that investment. So I think, um, to return to my specialty of cardiology, I think we're well beyond the descending limb of the Starling curve. For those of you who are doctors and nurses, you remember the old arguments about is there a descending limb? But um, I think we're really into a phase where as we spend more and more money, it's not just that we're flat. We're actually seeing um, it's hurting the generation of reliable evidence. And I think um, it's compelling that we need to do something about it. So this came up yesterday, and I, you know, I want to thank my old colleagues at FDA for being diligent. I told the story that, you know, actually it's true. We, we had, I, I actually love the Cures legis legislation. I know there are people that don't like it so much. I think it's right on target. But a couple of things happened in the last 48 hours when we were shut out of the um, feedback process, and one of them was um, when you look at Part B there, real, real world evidence defined. So this is. For those of you who are Americans, this is the law. So you can have your own definition if you want to, but this is actually what the law says the definition is. But it used to say other, other than randomized clinical trials. Now it says other than traditional clinical trials. And I think that's really important. And it came up over and over yesterday. Just to say it again, real world evidence uh, is not at the exclusion of randomization. Randomization is one of many methods that can be used to transform real-world uh, data into real-world evidence. All right, so here are the um, key elements that, um, after um, sort of uh, trying to absorb all the discussion yesterday that I think are really critical. And here's where I really um, felt good about yesterday. If you looked at the panel yesterday, I think we are close to having a reusable system embedded in practice. And um, these are slides we developed um, at the FDA. First of all, based on concepts that people like Greg Simon were working on decades ago with the idea that if you um, are collecting digital data as a part of every encounter and you um, send that data somewhere electronically to a place where it can be analyzed, you can learn from it. And um, I can now say for sure that now that I'm part of Silicon Valley, this is really the key to Amazon, uh, Google, Apple, and Facebook. It's that every interaction you have with the system is being digitized, is digital, and it's being set, uh, analyzed in a central place. And if there's one thing about machine learning that um, you know, I'm now completely convinced of, uh, the bigger the numbers, the better the machine learning gets. Um, but it's not all about machine learning. It's just about learning, per se. And so um, I believe that what we saw yesterday in the panel is that we have public-private par partnerships that are evolving to the place where uh, this could actually be done. And, you know, the fundamental concept is we now in the U.S. have a limited number of health systems that are increasingly integrated and are dependent for business purposes on having more and more sophisticated data warehouses where the information goes. And Kaiser has been doing this for a long time, so it was good that we heard uh, from Kaiser yesterday. Um, what's been missing in most of our health systems is the um, intelligence actually coming back to the point of care. 
but it's entirely technically possible to do this. This is the way successful businesses run, and there's no reason that successful healthcare systems shouldn't do the same thing. So you noticed yesterday when we talked about Sentinel, basically it's built on clusters of uh, payers um, brought together, uh, sharing information in a federated way with a coordinating center. And then you noticed uh, when there was a dis uh, discussion about Nest, essentially the same concept, except the clusters now are built around um, a combination of payers, but also these integrated health systems uh, with their nodes. And um, we talked a little bit about PCORnet, which I'm now uh, back to being very involved in, and for comparative effectiveness research, we have a major investment in 34 health systems linked together, uh, curating their data to a common data model every three months. But I think what's really exciting about this is that the fundamental building blocks of these systems, whether you're talking about drugs, devices, or um, comparative effectiveness research, are the same. It's clusters of, in a fabric of, in, of payers, integrated health systems, and registries were also brought up yesterday, sort of cutting across this with high fidelity data. And I think what we're learning in PCORnet is once systems get in the habit of curating their data, um, it gets easier every time it's done. It's very painful to do it the first time, but then it gets better and better. And I think um, if these various systems can work together in a federated way, I think we're uh, getting uh, close to having a national system that can be reused at a very low cost for different kinds of questions. And this is very much envisioned by CDRH at the FDA. Um, and, and this, you know, one of my favorite slides from my time there. And, you know, you could, I, I think uh, the, the drugs uh, and biologics have led the way here. Uh, devices are really moving quickly, and I think have embraced a lot of this um, very quickly. But going from passive to active surveillance, there were some great articles yesterday in major journals about the sort of ridiculous difficulty of dealing with spontaneous adverse events and trying to make sense of what they mean, where you don't have numerators and denominators, and they're so influenced by things like news stories that um, cause peaks and valleys of these things. And rather than having um, sort of a parallel universe of experiments done on human beings separate from clinical practice doing the research in clinical practice, um, rather than having inefficient studies where you build it and then tear it down and then build it and then tear it down at great expense, having a reusable system. And of course, this gets to part, another thing that was somewhat discussed yesterday, this arbitrary division between pre-market and post-market, which is a critical societal determination that you can put a product on the market. So it's good to have a bright line there, obviously. You need it. But um, where that line is drawn can be quite different depending on the patient needs um, and the type of product. But the thing we've been missing is a reliable post-market system that really delivers the goods. And I think um, what we uh, covered yesterday makes it possible that that could happen. But it's not just for observing. It is for clinical trials also. And I just point to the collaboratory that was also mentioned yesterday, where I think the NIH is showing that you can do outcome clinical trials using electronic health record data at a cost that's about 10 percent of the cost of traditional clinical trials. So imagine if you could take all that money, the other 90 percent, and put it into developing new uh, products or actually understanding um, the outcomes from the old products. The second concept is to use quality by design. And I won't dwell on this, because I, I think some of the other speakers will talk about it. But I'd refer you to the city uh, work in this um, regard. For those of you who haven't spent a lot of time thinking about this, um, the real key is when you look at the trial that you want to do, is getting rid of errors that matter, not focusing your energy on errors that don't matter. In fact, it's okay to have a lot of errors if they don't matter, because you could spend a lot of money stopping out uh, useless errors, and in fact, that's what happens. And this requires not that you have a rigid set of SOPs, but that you actually have a brain. That's um, the problem here. You can't do this by a recipe. You actually have to understand 
the question you're asking, the clini <laughs> clinical context, the needs of uh, patients, um, and uh, the other therapies that are available in the field. And so the goal is to obtain, and you'll notice the word reliable here um, over and over, to obtain reliable results. And I do like Greg's point that um, the goal of a clinical trial, I think, almost always is to make a prediction about what's going to happen in the future, because you're using it not to understand what happened in the past, but to make a prediction about what's going to happen if you applied that treatment to the next set of uh, patients, and that's what we should be thinking about. And I won't uh, dwell on it except to say there's a methodical way to go about this in designing a trial which will take you away from much of what's in GCP if you apply it to this later uh, phase, uh, expansive phase of clinical research that we're talking about. And it requires that you objectively identify the potential risk and uh, nail them down and uh, focus your cost and effort on taking care of the risks that you can identify, not uh, the ones that um, have occurred in other types of research and then mitigate those risks uh, specifically. There's a, a toolkit you can find on the website. This is just the beginning. I'm sure it can get better and better. The third element is using automation for repetitive tasks. And um, I, this is the one that I probably um, am having the hardest time absorbing in the other half of my job now when I'm not in a university. But um, you begin to think about the things we take for granted now about navigation because um, there is um, an infrastructure which is free that has every road in the United States in it. And it's not just the company I work for, it's uh, several companies have done this, um, but it has made a big difference in people's lives because there is that fundamental infrastructure. And so now the playing field is not do you have a map of every road, the playing field is what do you do given that you have that map? How do you actually use that information and other things you might add to it uh, to make life better? One of my favorite ones that the company I do work for is doing now is um, as little cars go around and take the pictures of everything in the environment, they're also now ingesting the environment and analyzing it. So you'll soon see on Google Maps um, uh, a, a depiction of what you're breathing in when you're taking a particular route, which I'm not sure what we'll do with that information, but um, <laughs> it, it's pretty interesting. And then the other part of it is because that infrastructure exists in other free areas like um, Google Search, uh, the entire system is built on a constant uh, learning system. You, know, you don't uh, accrue the data and wait six months to look at it. You have constant analysis of the data applied. And where there's a rational question, um, within all these companies, and it's taught in business school now, unfortunately not in medical school in the first semester, uh, they use what's called an A-B comparison, which is a pragmatic randomized trial to answer the question. Because in business, they figured out that observational data is not good enough if the effect is small and that you actually need randomization to sort it out. And if you're running a business, it's the quickest way to get the answer so that you can make the best decision for your business to improve your profitability and deserve, deliver better service to the customer. So it makes you wonder why for things like selling you shoes, randomization has become the coin of the realm, but for something so important as how to treat your depression or what to do about your cancer, we mostly have doctors guessing 85 or more percent of the time when it's within our grasp to, to have a system that could deliver the results. And then finally, which I, I think all the other speakers are going to talk about, um, operate from basic principles. If we go down the route in this new era of having a rigid set of SOPs, we'll get ourselves right into the same conundrum. And again, I want to emphasize that doesn't mean that we should just have willy-nilly um, do whatever you feel like doing. I think people do need guidance on what to do. And this is just my list of some of the uh, principles. and I. I know Rory will uh, talk about this. One of the most important ones where I see errors being made is ran not distinguishing random error from systematic error. And random error can almost always be made up for by um, having more events or you know, roughly think of it as larger sample size, but it's really 
uh, the number of events. Systematic error, there's almost no way to recover it unless you're somehow able to measure what caused the systematic error, which is a pretty risky thing to do. So I want to uh, sort of close by um, taking two of the cases that came up yesterday. Um, I, I knew more about Le uh, Levy's case than I uh, wanted to say. I was, I was a little bit involved in it. But, you know, I think it's a great example, and he raised it, so I'll just say a, another word about it. Let's say you're doing a trial to determine if drug X lowers the risk of death and stroke in patients with atrial fibrillation. It takes 18,000 people to show this, but it's a huge cause of death and disability in the world, well worth it even for a modest treatment effect. And it takes multiple years of follow-up. Thousands of patients had already been studied to determine the dosing regimen. What did it mean when an FDA inspector said, we can't really have confidence in your result because you didn't record the exact time in which the patients ingested the drug over the course of years for a BID drug? Well, um, what it costed was probably on the order of uh, $10 million. But the fact that it wasn't done put the company at risk, and in fact, this actually happened for multiple billions of dollars because it delayed uh, the FDA's evaluation of the application. So then you get, begin to get a sense of why the conservatism gets into the industry about doing these things, even if it's not useful. So um, this is one of the many reasons why I think we need to go from the conceptual discussion to actually writing things down that help people inside the FDA and the many people outside the FDA deal with it. And then uh, the other one that was brought up, and um, I'll have to go through this quickly, but uh, we had an intense discussion at dinner last night about the diabetes case um, where our, um, I don't know if uh, she's here, but um, you know, the issue was brought up, why are you guys so concerned about death? Those of us with diabetes have um, uh, all sorts of microvascular complications that you're totally ignoring. And so I think if we apply what I've said to uh, the whole area of diabetes, I would argue we do need to know about death. And in fact, it, without the outcome trials, we wouldn't know what we know today, which is some classes of drugs lower mortality and others don't. That's pretty important to know. But we didn't have to spend the amount of money we spent to find that out. It could have been done in a much more efficient way, and I hope we can do that. But for the microvascular complications, this is where the automation really comes in. I think if we now look at the tools that are becoming available through digital examination, we're going to be able to radically reduce the cost of understanding the microvascular complications. The point of this is that there's not one solution to the multiple issues that people have about diabetes, but if we continue to apply one set of operating principles to all of it, we're going to waste most of the money that we could spend much better getting the answers that people need. Um, and, and I'll just finish with this. I, I think it's interesting, this discussion about what are the incentives for sharing. It, it's, a, it's just a thought I can't get away from that maybe sharing should be like a fundamental ethical principle, not something that you have to get paid to do. And I guess that's sort of a um, naive view of the, the way the world works. But if you started by saying sharing is the first principle and you need a reason not to do it, you might come to a different conclusion. If I had a rare genetic disease today, it would be intolerable for me to see health systems um, hoarding their data because there is no way to solve the problems of rare diseases without massive sharing of information to get the studies done more quickly. And then I'll close with this slide that I'm still uh, scratching my head about, which is the other environment and the way that computing is being thought about. Um, un until recently, the goal of computing was to optimize the functioning of the individual. And, um, I, you know, I think a lot of progress has been made there, although the avalanche of email might not be optimal functioning. We certainly have access to more information than we've ever had. But the future is really collective intelligence. And collective intelligence can't happen unless there's, there's massive sharing. But if it did, we would probably get answers to these many questions at not just an incremental rate, but actually a logarithmically better rate. So sorry for uh, going on there, but um, you all gave me a lot to think about yesterday. 
So let's uh, now go into the next session. All right. <laughs>